Welcome to Deconstructing, where I take apart an iconic horror movie to find out what makes it tick. By now, we've deconstructed lots of classic films by John Carpenter, George Romero, Toby Hooper, Wes Craven, Dario Argento, and so on. But lately, we've been getting requests to cover the work of legendary Italian director Lucio Fulci. We want to keep you folks happy, so today I'm going to break down the maestro's most revered horror epic. This surreal and outrageously gory haunted house tale is one of Fulci's loosely defined Gates of Hell trilogy, and it's considered a cult classic now. But that wasn't always the case, and fans had to wait until 1998, 17 years after its Italian premiere, to see a fully restored and uncut version, partly due to support from one of its biggest fans, a guy named Quentin Tarantino. Very, very interesting. If you're not familiar with Lucio Fulci's body of work, I'll catch you up, but be prepared for some pretty sick stuff. We can't show you the goriest bits thanks to YouTube's Thought Police, but I'll make sure you get the general idea. As with all our deconstructing picks, we're dividing our coverage into three parts. Origin, in which I'll give you some background on Fulci's long career and trace the movie's path from concept to screen. Legacy, where I'll talk about its steadily growing cult of fans, its history of censorship, and eventual rediscovery. And Mystery, as I examine some lesser-known facts, rumors, and theories about the film's creation and the story's ever-evolving canon. So buckle up and prepare yourself for the weirdest trip to New Orleans you could possibly imagine. And believe me, that's saying a lot, because I'm about to deconstruct Lucio Fulci's 1981 splatter classic, The Beyond. <laughs> Despite a long and prolific career, Lucio Fulci was virtually unknown outside of Europe until 1979 when he collaborated with producer Fabrizio De Angelis on Zombie Due, a phony sequel to George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead which was titled Zombie in Italy and became a major hit, triggering an avalanche of Living Dead knockoffs. They're everywhere! After the success of Zombie Due, Fulci went on to make City of the Living Dead, the first of a loose trilogy about the seven entrances to hell. It performed well in Europe and Fulci reteamed with De Angelis for a second chapter. Fulci worked with co-writers Giorgio Mariuzzo and Dardano Sacchetti on the treatment. The script itself is basically just a framework for a series of gruesome death scenes that Fulci already had in mind, which explains the haphazard story structure and wild leaps in logic. What the hell's going on around here? I don't know! Sacchetti was mainly responsible for the core concept of a doorway between the worlds of the living and the dead, and drew on elements from H.P. Lovecraft to portray a netherworld where the laws of nature no longer apply, and time and space become twisted and broken. That helped put the story's dream logic in context, but a lot of that disjointed feeling came from the lack of a complete shooting script. In fact, many scenes were basically made up on the day they were shot. Impossible. For his leads, Fulci reached out to actress Catherine McCall, known in Italy as Catriona McCall, who had worked with him previously on City of the Living Dead, and would go on to star in the third Gates of Hell installment, The House by the Cemetery. David Warbeck had also worked with Fulci on The Black Cat, and had a good working relationship with the director. The production was shot almost entirely in and around New Orleans, and Larry Ray of the Louisiana Film Commission was so helpful in scouting and securing locations that Fulci hired him to be the film's production manager. Ray also spoke fluent Italian, so he also served as interpreter. Several iconic New Orleans sites appear in the film, from the famous Lake Pontchartrain Causeway to the legendary St. Louis Cemetery No. 1. The hotel that serves as the main location is the landmark Otis House in Madisonville, which still stands as part of Fairview Riverside State Park. But most of the film's memorable kills took place on a soundstage back in Italy. Practical effects guru Gianetto De Rossi, a frequent collaborator with Fulci, designed many of the film's iconic gore scenes, including the murder of occult artist Schweik. <laughs> the eyeball gouging scenes, the tarantula attack in the library, and a graphic headshot that made the cover of countless horror magazines, including Chaz Ballon's beloved publication Deep Red. Sorry I had to dodge the goriest parts, but YouTube would have age-gated this video, and we gotta pay the rent, you know what I'm saying? Released in April of 1981, The Beyond didn't go over as well in Italy as Zombie Due or City of the Living Dead, but it was a modest hit throughout most of Europe. 
Nessuno, Emily. Sento la presenza di qualcun altro in questa stanza. Except, of course, for the UK, where it made the notorious video nasties list. It didn't even reach the United States until two years later, and only in a severely cut form with a different score under the title Seven Doors of Death. Filled with unrelenting excitement, a truly original haunted house thriller. Tobe Hooper, director of Poltergeist. Seven Doors of Death, it will scare the hell out of you. For over a decade, that was the only official cut available in the U.S., although thousands of fans managed to pass around Falchi's original cut through horror conventions and mail-order tape trading groups. That all changed in 1998 when indie distribution outfit Grindhouse Releasing, founded by Oscar-winning editor Bob Morosky and the late Sage Stallone, son of Sly, partnered with Quentin Tarantino's own company, Rolling Thunder, to restore the original cut and release it to theaters for a series of midnight screenings. Sadly, Fulci would not live to see that release as he passed away from complications due to diabetes in 1996. Since its restoration, the Beyond has experienced a major renaissance and new generations of fans worldwide. The legacy even extends far beyond the film itself, thanks to a fantastic comic book adaptation from Aban Press, which takes its name from the Book of Aban referenced in the film. The acclaimed score by frequent Fulci collaborator Fabio Frizzi has been a favorite of soundtrack collectors as well, and helped boost the composer's popularity, leading to international concert tours and a remastered album release. Considering its complicated history and overall weirdness, it's a given the Beyond brings with it a heap of mysteries, obscure factoids, and fan interpretations. Here are a few of my favorites. Although it's only referenced a few times in the film, the occult grimoire introduced in the prologue has its own literary history. The fictional tome was created by author Clark Ashton Smith in 1933, and it became part of H.P. Lovecraft's larger Cthulhu mythos. It's sort of an archaic version of the Necronomicon, and it's said to contain many similar spells. That book's been there for two years. Nobody wants to buy it. The sigil on the book's cover was created for the movie and was based on a tattoo acquired by Fulci's daughter, Antonella. The living dead rise and attack many times during the beyond, especially during the climactic hospital scene. But apart from Schweik, Fulci hadn't planned to put any more zombies in the film. But the financial backers insisted on many more, mainly because Zombie Due had been a box office hit throughout Europe and they wanted to replicate that success. The pre-title sequence, which shows an angry mob hunting down and executing Schweik for practicing black magic, is sepia-toned in Fulci's final cut, so the shift to modern day would be more dramatic. But for some reason, the German release used the color version instead. It's available as a special feature on most DVD and Blu-ray releases. As I mentioned earlier, Grindhouse releasing co-founder Bob Morosky is also an award-winning film editor, whose credits include Sam Raimi's first Spider-Man adaptation in 2002. Since he owned the rights to the Beyond, Morosky paid tribute to Fulci by inserting a brief shot of the tarantula attack during Peter Parker's dream sequence following the radioactive spider bite. This may sound like a crazy fan theory, but it's confirmed by several people involved. Fulci's original concept portrayed the afterlife as a giant amusement park, where the dead are all having a great time. The producers actually liked this idea, but it would have been too expensive to carry off. So he changed it to a barren wasteland littered with corpses, which admittedly is a lot creepier than some sort of eternal Disneyland. Forty years later, The Beyond still has horror fans divided. Most of Fulci's serious fans consider it his masterpiece, and critics' reviews have been much kinder over the past couple of decades. Sure, it's a smorgasbord of style over substance, but many classics of Italian cinema discard traditional narrative to create a more dreamlike feeling. If The Beyond can be experienced as a waking nightmare, then it's one bad dream worth revisiting. I can't explain it to you. Just take my word for it. Are you a fan of The Beyond? If so, why not share your opinions and interpretations in the comments section? Ah! 
While you're here, be sure to drop us a like, and if you want to see more deconstructing episodes, subscribe to our channel, and you will face the sea of darkness and all therein that may be explored. Or something like that. <laughs>